Hello, everybody. Welcome again to another edition of the MCHD Paramedic Podcast. This is Dr. Casey Patrick, and today we have our regular guest, our medical director, Rob Dixon. Hi, everybody. And over the past five, probably seven years, we have totally, appropriately spent an enormous amount of time talking, thinking, operationalizing ischemic stroke care and education here in Montgomery County. The advent of endovascular therapy has been a 120% game changer in emergency medicine as far as how we can approach large vessel occlusion strokes and how we can push for improved outcomes. Uh, But the most basic stroke lectures always start with the 80-20 rule, and that's 80% ischemic and 20% hemorrhagic. So what about those 20% of strokes that are hemorrhagic? And no, we're not going to have CT results in the 911 truck, but how can EMS clinicians better recognize, try to sort out these ischemic versus hemorrhagic strokes? And that's really going to be the focus of the podcast today. So let's start with a few basic assumptions, some vocabulary. As always, we want to start with a level playing field so we can build upon that uh, with uh, continuity. So when we talk about hemorrhagic strokes for this discussion, we're going to talk today about non-traumatic hemorrhagic strokes. So these aren't people hitting the head with baseball bats. These aren't people that fell off the roof. Traumatic brain injury is an entirely different beast with different pathophysiology, different causes, even different treatments at times. So listen back to prior episodes where we've talked a lot about the epic trial and traumatic brain injury for those specifics but today we're going to talk about non-traumatic hemorrhagic strokes and when we talk about terminology it's important to remember that intracerebral hemorrhage or ICH brain bleed hemorrhagic stroke all three of those things are for the most part equal would you agree I agree 100 percent I mean I think that we get caught a lot in trying to confuse the vocabulary here. And when you think back, I I look at all bleeding in the brain, atraumatic bleeding in the brain, and then you put it, depends on geography of where it's located and where it came from. So you have the subarachnoid space, you have subarachnoid hemorrhage, you have intraparenchymal hemorrhages or ICHs. uh, And what causes these things? Uh, And then I'm sorry, epidural and subdural. Right, so kind of different mechanisms, and I'll, I'll give a patient with like each one, right? Sure, and that works. Subdural is, you know, your classic head strike on thinners, right? And they have a, a thin layer of the, in their, they rip a bridging vein. It's usually a little bit of a slower bleed than, a, than an epidural hematoma. The epidural hematoma story is the, the lucid moment. The kid that gets hit in the head with a bat, he's okay for a while, uh, goes home, and then has a decline as you have an expanding hematoma and pressure on the brain. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, that's your sentinel sudden onset headaches, right? Those are the headaches that worry us. Uh, And the ICH is just basically, it's a golf ball, baseball within the brain parenchyma itself. So that's kind of by location, it's all about location and then what causes the different, uh, you know, uh, bleeding into different locations. And really, to take it back again, hemorrhagic stroke, non-traumatic, intracerebral hemorrhage, brain bleed, these are really interchangeable in any of these locations. Yeah. It's an intracerebral hemorrhage. It's a bleed inside your brain. And what most of these end up arising from, from a non-traumatic standpoint, is a ruptured cerebral aneurysm. Berry aneurysm, lots of terms we can, we can pull out often found in the circle of Willis. And that is what Dr. Dixon just said. That's the patient walking around, normal, asymptomatic, thunderclap, lightning bolt, acute onset, worst headache of the life with usual secondary alteration and confusion, headache, nausea, and vomiting. But there are other things that predispose us for non-traumatic hemorrhagic strokes. What are some of those? And when we get into different locations, sometimes the causes for these bleeding problems can change. So long-standing hypertension, uh, vascular pass, get atherosclerosis, they get spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage or spontaneous non-traumatic hemorrhagic stroke. But oftentimes hypertensive bleeds are deeper 
more more uh, you know uh, thalamus uh, deeper deeper brain yeah not in the not in the outside of the cortex generally yeah non-cortical was the word i was looking for there i myself had a brief seizure and, uh, and you know i like to always say that let's go back to what you said i think it's important long-standing hypertension so let's not I, I hate getting work too worked up about hypertension because you know when we when we say to people watch your blood pressure doctor you'll have a stroke right we should say in 5 10 or 15 years not in 5 10 or 15 seconds right this is chronic chronic hypertension over years that damages the vessel wall and you have spontaneous ICH. It's not due necessarily to one spike in pressure or one episode of blood pressure. So just to be clear, kind of one of my little pet peeves there. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Excellent aside, 100% agreement. Yeah. Uh, Other our, stuff that Casey did mention, you know, hypertension, hypertension, hypertension. Those are number one, two, and three. And then vascular malformations, these arterial venous malformation, which is kind of uh, where you have abnormal connections between the arterioles and the venules, and you have a propensity to bleed, tumors, things like that. So that's just a little little background. You know, subarachnoid bleeding, most common, ruptured cerebral aneurysms. That's usually surface level of the brain, cortical bleeding. That can extend to interventricular spaces if it's large enough. The deeper non-cortical deep brain hemorrhagic collections more often from long-standing hypertension uh, excellent uh, point of clarity there let's roll into cases that's where this really we can expand out and talk a little more in detail about some of the specifics that we run into on the truck so we'll start with case number one we're going to do a couple today 51 year old male call is for acute headache with altered mental status and nausea and vomiting not an uncommon call. Uh, this is uh, obviously a, an emergent situation. Uh, the dispatchers have assigned a serious dispatch determinant. We go lights and sirens. Why? The patient has a GCS of 5. Their blood pressure upon arrival is 230 over 110. Their heart rate is 45. And their respirations are kind of irregular at about 6. So let's one more time, 51-year-old acute headache and altered, really altered, GCS is 5, BP is 230 over 110, heart rate's 45, irregularly inefficient respirations at around 6. So, yeah, you guessed it. We included Cushing's triad today. Cushing's triad is uh, respiration abnormalities, decreased heart rate, increased blood pressure seen in the face of increased intracranial pressure. Like most triads we talk about, where is this seen most commonly? On tests. On tests. Yes. So don't make or break your decision making based on Cushing's triad. Because sometimes you may have two of the three, sometimes you may have one of the three. But for all those out there that study, and hopefully that's all of us, you may see that on a test somewhere, so we felt like that was worth including. But let's move into the actual patient care portion yeah. of this patient. GCS of five, respiration six, hemodynamically deranged. Where are you going to go next? Serial killers, right? This is an altered mental status serial killer, right? It's in, in our algorithm, so we're thinking that differential. But first and foremost, we need to stabilize what we can, right? This is a peri-arrest patient. Remember from the, from the MOVES podcast, this is a patient with altered mental status and deranged vital signs, right? They're at high, high risk. So what does that mean? Full monitoring, oxygen supplementation, plus minus BVM, vascular access, epinephrine if it's needed, not needed, or vascular support in patients, and sugar and sedation plan. So all those bundles, very similar to our DSI bundle, right? We have altered mental status, we have severe blood pressure abnormalities. So this is a patient that likely is not protecting their airway. It's gonna have, potentially have airway patency problems that we're gonna consider going down the DSI pathway. The moves looks very similar to the setup for DSI. So it's some of the safety bundle is the same. I check in the rule of 15s in there. 
I may not, it's not the priority if they're not, if they're not having uh, patency issues right now. It's not the n number one priority, but I'm going to be ready, Casey. I'm going to put the head of the bed up at 15. They get Apox at 15. They get non-rebreather at 15 liters per minute and a spontaneous breather or BVM with up to 15 of PEEP in the non-spontaneous breather. Then I'm going down the rest of my differential, getting one of the firemen or one of the attendants to get a sugar for me just to rule out those other things. Well, let me give you a little bit more info on our patient. So definitely moves. We're all probably with a respiration of six and a GCS of five. When those, right to when those two things are equal, we're, we're moving towards a bag and probably moving towards managing the airway. Some of it's going to depend on your proximity to the hospital, how many hands you have on scene. There's always those pieces of the puzzle, how safe your scene is. You know, are you on the roadside? Are you in a house? Are you in an apartment complex, third floor? Lots of things come into play. But let's just say that our oxygen saturation is 100% and our end is 52 so in titles climbing a bit why because we're not ventilating normally but we're not in a capital e 96 font emergent situation yet to go back to your point we have to put our safety net in place and that's going to be a combination of the moves bundle and our dsi safety bundle why because we can't kill the brain at the expense of plastic tubes that will be a bad idea so we have to pre-ox we have to get our hard stops into place, 90 systolic, which is not an issue here yet, yet. and 94% for three minutes on our oxygenation. Now, one thing about ICH non-traumatic hemorrhagic stroke patients, and this is anecdotal for me, but also I believe uh, evidence supported, I, you will echo this. This patient's blood pressure is 230 over 110. You heard that, heard that correctly. And I would absolutely, before I intubated this patient, have vasopressors at hand because especially with sedation and paralysis, these are some of the most labile patients that we can take care of in all of the spectrum that we take care of related to their autonomic instability because they've got a bunch of pressure on their brain. Right, and, and when you think about it, the horse is out of the barn here. What are we trying to do? Number one, we're trying to protect the brain, the, the function of the brain. What hurts the brain? Hypoxemia hurts the brain. Hy hypoventilation hurts the brain. Hypercapnia hurts the brain. And hypotension hurts the brain. So those are the things we're really going to focus on in the podcast. And after I got my bundle set up, we'd be trying to mine those. I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. You put these people on positive pressure ventilation. We're giving them a bunch of sedation we take away all their peripheral tone with paralysis it's no surprise that they could drop their pressure so let's talk a little bit about why they drop their pressure and why their autonomics are unstable and that has to do a hundred percent with the fact that their intracerebral pressure has increased and their cerebral perfusion pressure is potentially compromised so equation time cerebral perfusion pressure equals your mean arterial pressure minus your intracranial pressure. Cool. So these people have an increase in ICP. Their MAP increases from a compensatory standpoint to keep the CPP, the cerebral perfusion pressure, level. But they've got increased ICP. And anytime someone has increased ICP, whether it's trauma or non-trauma, they are autonomically labile. So we don't want to decrease the ICP excuse me, said that wrong. We don't want to increase the ICP in any way, shape or form beyond what's already there. Like Dr. Dixon said, the, the horse is already out. We're just trying to minimize the collateral damage. So we don't want to, I'll say it one more time so it's clear, we don't want to increase the ICP any more than the brain hemorrhage has already done that for us. So what are some ways while we're running the rule of 15s, this isn't an intubation podcast, but we're running the rule of 15s, we've got our hard stops in place, we are set our three minute timer for oxygenation. What are some things that we can do if we don't pay attention that may actually help to increase the ICP? Yeah, I mean, positioning, right? What is it Dr. Levitan says? Lying flat is the position that you lie in a coffin, right? We, we're gonna, 
we're going to get this patient ready for DSI. So our head of the bed's coming up at 15 degrees. That's where you want it, right? It's a trade-off. We want to perfuse the brain, but we also need cerebral drainage from the brain or ICP goes up. So mine, head of the bed up, you want to keep from constricting the neck. So if you've got maybe the patient had a collapse with their ICH and you don't know if they've got a cervical injury, lots of them are getting cervical collars, right? You could put one on, just make sure it's not too tight. Things that constrict the neck, other stuff that would constrict the, the flow of the neck. Remember, the jugular veins that drain the brain are very, very peripheral. Even something as a tight tube tamer can really, really be problematic. And the fourth bit of that would be appropriate sedation, right? A agitated, thrashing patient is an increased ICP patient. So those are kind of the four simple things that I think about to try to optimize to try to do what I can to control their ICP in the field. It's already going to be increased. They've got a brain hemorrhage. We don't want to increase it anymore. Head of bed up, sedation adequate. Don't Im impair your venous return. Tube tamers, C collars. If you need them, just make sure they're not constricting. Anytime we talk about intracerebral hemorrhage and intubating this patient, I go back to my training. I know you did the same thing I did. It was in vogue in the early 2000s to really hyperventilate these patients. The idea being that if we drive down the PCO2, we decrease the ICP in some way, shape, or form. There's not a lot of hard evidence for this. There's not a randomized controlled trial that exists. But the general teaching now is that extremes of anything in these patients are probably bad. So it's not common in ICUs and neuro ICUs to drive patients PCO2 to 20 or 25 like we did 20 years ago. But we also don't want 55. So we want to be in some normo ventilation range. So shoot for a normal range. No recommendations exist currently to blow these patients to subnormal uh, values with some uh, idea that that's going to cause decreased ICP. So shoot for an end title of 40 because like everything else in this patient, we're trying not to add to the scale. They've already got a big burden on their scale of badness, and that is an intracerebral hemorrhage. Let's not add hyper or hypoglycemia. Let's not add fever, hypoxia, hypotension, hypoventilation, or extreme hyperventilation. What about Hail Marys in this case? And this is outside protocols for all you MCHD listeners. We're not adding new protocols. There is no uh, protocol for this treatment in your book. We're talking in generalities for all the listeners out there. In the hospital, you get this patient. What are you thinking about giving them? I'm thinking about giving them what I have on hand, which is sodium bicarb. In the, in the hospital, we have mannitol. We have other things to decrease ICP, but the peri-arrest intracranial pressure patient, regardless of what it's from, and most of the time it's from one of these hemorrhagic strokes, most common, uh, what you have at hand in the truck is sodium bicarb. Remember, 8.4% sodium bicarb we have has a very large sodium load. 50 to 100 milli equivalents. I don't parse hairs with, with the dose. You can do mannitol, you can do other things in the hospital, but remember that's in the Pixis, right? That's still someone has to run to the Pixis to get it. If you have a patient that's actively in, in peri or near cardiac arrest, the sodium bicarb is right there. Open up the crash cart, grab two ampules of it and give it. So there actually is some evidence for this and it appears in small studies and we'll put this in the show notes to work similarly similar efficacy to hypertonic saline and you know some of y'all out there may be in flight services or in critical care transport situations where you may have mannitol or hypertonic, or hypertonic yeah three percent saline uh, five percent saline there's different concentrations but basically just dehydrating the brain, right? It's a sodium load or an osmotic load, and it's meant that whole osmotic idea to kind of suck the, the edema out from the, or put it back in, I'm sorry, put the inside of the blood vessels to be hypertonic to draw the excess edema in. And basically it's to buy us some time, right? To buy us some time to decompressive craniotomy to other therapies that we may need. But as Casey said, Please, 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 MCHD, not in protocol, 
this is a big Hail Mary. Most of these patients that we've seen get this don't do terribly well. No, this would be a, a, a real one-off in, in an epidural yeah. hematoma type situation where you were temporizing in order to buy time for, right. for a decompressive craniotomy. And if you get the uh, desire to push a couple amps of bicarb in an MCHD uniform, this is definitely a district chief plus or minus medical director decision, Absolutely. just to say that as clearly as possible. So there's case one. Let's, let's roll into case two. And when we start out here, we're going to sound fairly similar, and then we'll diverge. Case two is a 51-year-old male. Call is for acute headache with altered mentation and nausea and vomiting. Stem sounds exactly the same, huh? Well, let's delve into the details a little bit, and I'll let you take it. This is a GCS of 14 in this situation. He's repetitive, a little confused, but follows commands, answers some things appropriately, knows his name, gets confused to time. Blood pressure is 230 over 110. Sounds fairly similar, but the heart rate, 75 in this situation with a respiratory rate of 16. So we have a similar case in some ways, but very different in others. So where do you think the medic's mind is gonna go when they see GCS of 14, acute headache with ultra mental status and vomiting, heart rate of 75, respirations of 16, and the blood pressure is 230 over 110. I hope it goes back to the podcast we did on hypertensive crisis. This is a hypertensive crisis, right? We're not in the stroke mobile. We don't have a CT scanner, so we don't know if it's a bad headache with existing blood pressure. We don't know if it's a stroke, if the patient examines normally, but this one doesn't. He's confused. So that makes me very suspicious for end organ tissue damage. I think that that's one that we very, very carefully try to lower that blood pressure a little bit for a couple of reasons, right? If it's a, a hemorrhagic stroke, we, we don't want the extremes. You don't want too high, you don't want too low. And if for some reason it's ischemic, we want to keep them in that 185 over 110, less than that for candidacy for both TNK and endovascular. That's my thought process. So we've inserted the blood pressure control lever into our protocols those have probably been in there for seven or eight years since since you started here at mchd with your stroke push to get that 185 over 110 bar met and why is that bar important that bar has been the long-standing bar for tpa administration whether alteplase or tenecteplase now with the advent of endovascular therapy that also is a bar for being eligible for endovascular therapy lots of times as well. So that's an ischemic stroke situation. What about this patient where it's not lateralizing, we don't have unilateral findings, uh, fast type findings, or even B fast. We've got just a globally altered patient with a headache and vomiting that's very hypertensive. In that situation, we don't have a stroke truck, but we're thinking to ourselves, this sounds and smells and quacks a little more like a hemorrhagic duck than an ischemic duck. How nervous do we need to get and how aggressive should we be with that blood pressure management? This is a great question, Casey. If you ask 10 different practitioners, medics, ICU nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians, you're going to get 10 different answers on this. There is a little evidence. Dr. Patrick's going to go over that in which way it's pointing it, but I'm just going to, I'm going to be the, the, the medium person and say not too high, but not too low. They could both do damage. I think just in the sweet spot, what's that sweet spot? I think that sweet spot is somewhere less than one, 140 to 160 systolic. That's and I can hear the medics out there saying, but okay, doc, you're telling me that you get this patient and we deliver them to you with a pressure 200. You're not going to chew us out. You're going to go get a CAT scan. You're going to see an intracerebral hemorrhage and you're going to put them on a cardine drip, right? And the answer is probably E, yes. all of the above, minus the fact that I'm not going to chew you out because here's the catch. If, and we're not going to do an EBM evidence-based journal club review of these studies. There are some folks out there who are miles, light years, uh, smarter and better at interpreting the literature than I am that have looked at these studies. But there's three of them, a couple more recent as well, that are the big ones in the world of rapid 
blood pressure management, and intracerebral hemorrhage. There's ICH ADAPT, there's INTERACT2, and there's ATTACH2. And if you just peruse these and you look at what happened in these studies, they looked at blood pressure lowering in ICH patients. And when you look at the outcomes that they measured and the secondary outcomes that they reported, you don't see a gigantic improvement in true patient-oriented outcomes when we rapidly lower blood pressure in ICH patients. For all the neurosurgeons who are listening, which I don't think there are any, but just in case, every time I call a neurosurgeon, they do have us lower blood pressure in the emergency department, and I will continue to do that. But the point of this little diatribe is not to ruffle any neurosurgeon feathers and not to try to tell you that I don't lower blood pressure in my ICH patients. I absolutely do. Cardine, labetalol push are very commonly used in my practice. And neurosurgery and ICU docs are going to continue to recommend and expect this. The key point, if you take home one thing from this entire discussion, is that if you take that patient who is 230 over 115 and you bomb them with labetalol or esmolol or cardine. God forbid hydralazine. Yeah, long-lasting, terrible hydralazine. And you turn them into, oh, wait, now we're 110 over 50. Isn't that pretty? Look at that nice number. You have absolutely harmed them, probably worse, I would say than if you just left them alone. So the moral of this story is don't live on the extremes. Slow and steady wins the race. Our goal is going to be somewhere in that 140 to 160 range. Newsflash, nobody knows the real answer. And when we've done this even really tightly, we see some secondary outcome improvements, but we don't see a ton of patient-oriented outcome improvement. And I tell you that, not to try to tell you not to control the pressure, but just know in the back of your mind that it's not some life-saving event. And there's no reason to get overly aggressive and to turn these paper people hormotensive because what happens sometimes, even with 10, 20 milligrams of levetol in these autonomically sensitive patients, it's really easy to take them from 230 to 110 with much less antihypertensive dose than would be effective in a normal brain patient. Slow and steady. Couldn't agree more. And I wanted to say, because we're getting close to the wrap up, I'm super proud of Dr. Patrick that he got through this 22 minutes on an ICH stroke talk and didn't say one thing about pupils. Doctor, I'm a I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm not going to steal his thunder on pupils. I'm just going to say one thing. We believe in the clinical exam here at MCSU. We want you to examine your patients. That being said, these two sick patients that we gave you, please don't look at their eyes first, right? Let's mind their airway and breathing and their circulation and their sugar and setting up the safety bundle. We can get to the eyes, but if the patient's awake and talking to us, what's the chance that we're going to see something in the eyes that's going to change our practice on these guys. So there's my, I'm, I'm going to bang on the pupils for Dr. Patrick because I know he's thinking about it. I just think it's, it's, it's beat down into us in medic school and everybody's so concerned about these eyes, like we're going to see one dilated and one not dilated indicating some type of, of, of a shift and a, and a herniation. Well, that patient's not going to be awake. They're going to be comatose. So. I say we just deal with their comatose and all the other interesting stuff that we need to do, all the priorities, then we get to their eyes. I'm going to leave that one with a big no comment <laughs> and move into the wrap-up, take us home. All right. Know your ICH basics. When we talk about these things, try to come up with a foundation, a framework that you use when placing these words into your sentences. Are we talking about a non-traumatic or a traumatic brain injury? Intracerebral hemorrhage, brain bleed, non-traumatic hemorrhagic stroke oftentimes can mean exactly the same thing. Think about your anatomy, think about the causes and the common presentations. When we talk about non-traumatic hemorrhagic stroke, over three quarters of these are gonna be acute onset headache from ruptured cerebral aneurysms with global altered mental status, global headache, plus or minus nausea or vomiting. These aren't the fast or be fast, typically, that we see with ischemic strokes. 
Cerebral perfusion pressure. Why is it important to know this equation? Cerebral perfusion pressure is equal to your MAP minus your ICP. So as ICP increases, CPP decreases. Don't have to be a math wizard to figure that one out. We know that ICP is already increased in a stroke patient with a brain bleed. Don't do anything else to make it worse. Head to bed up. Sedation adequate. Thrashing patients have increased ICP. Mind the neck, whether that's your tube tamer or your collar. Normal ventilation. Normal blood pressure. We don't want extremes. We don't want PCO2s of 80. We don't want PC to, PCO2s of 15 or in title CO2s of 15, in title CO2 of 18 or 80, excuse me, on the truck. We don't want blood pressures of 230, but we don't want 110 either. Remember, these people are autonomically sensitive, so small doses, close monitoring, don't get overzealous. When do we treat blood pressure in acute headaches? We treat blood pressure with ultra mental status or signs of end organ damage. We don't treat blood pressure in patients that are asymptomatic or even minor symptomatic with GCS is a 15. It's net detrimental, it can cause rebound watershed strokes. We treat end organ damage, not numbers. Uh, lastly, watch for these, think about these. These are a part of our altered mental status serial killers. We got stroke, which encompasses ischemic stroke. We talked a ton about it, but 20% of those are hemorrhagic. So don't ignore those. Seizure, sepsis, sugar, substances. Those are all on our list of ultra mental status serial killers. Don't forget those. Figure that's probably a good place to wrap us up. That's great. All right, y'all. Thanks for listening. As always, follow us wherever you listen to your podcast. Leave us a five star like only. We don't like four star, or especially three stars. That would really hurt my feelings. If you have ideas for future podcasts, you have, uh, I don't know, thoughts, questions, concerns, podcast at MCHD hyphen tx.org. As always, thanks for listening. We appreciate it. We'll be back again with a new episode soon.